Uh, I want to thank Brother Bill Ball again for coming to, to share with us this weekend. I know from your comments that he spoke to your heart. It was tremendous to see about 25, 26 of you standing here this morning and saying that God had spoken and he is speaking to you. And, you know, praise God, uh, he's the one that speaks. And he uses human vessels, but it's God that speaks. And I, I want to thank Bill tonight that he's been God's vessel for us to come and share in our conference here. He was with my son last weekend, and uh, God blessed there, and he's blessed here with us. And I just uh, ask you to welcome him again as he comes to share with us tonight. Thank you, good evening. I want to uh, just uh, clear up something before I start into the uh, message. Um, I wanna say thank you, first of all, for uh, your kindness to us, uh, for all uh, three of us, as far as uh, our missions uh, uh, reps here are concerned this weekend. Thank you for the gifts. I think we can say that. Thank you for the gifts that you gave us. Uh, I just want to clarify one of the gifts, okay? And um, this was one of the gifts that was in the bag, okay? I just, just want you to uh, maybe see. It might be hard for some of you at the back to see it, but I was sitting at a table today having lunch with eight people, and they were very, very anxious to see what was in the gift, in the gift bag. And so I went upstairs in the room where I was staying, and I went and grabbed the gift bag, and I brought it down, and I began to open all the gifts. Thank you, by the way, for the lovely picture of Fredericton, a uh, beautiful frame picture, and I will put that up in my office, and uh, I want to say thank you uh, for, for that as well. That was very, very special. And there were some very unique gifts. I want you to know that I'll do my best uh, to get the Laura Secord chocolates to my wife, I won't promise I will get them to my wife, uh, but I will do my best to get most of them, maybe, to my wife. How's that, okay? But then I got this gift, okay? And I looked at it, and I thought, Devon Park is a very conservative Baptist church. Why did they give me a pipe? <laughs> and I looked at it, and I thought, if I'm going to put something in there to smoke, how do I get it in, okay? Because it's kind of, if you'll see it, it's, it's kind of got a grill over the, over the top. Did you get one of these? You haven't opened your package. Brad, did you, op you open, did you get one of these? Okay, so maybe you can help me out a little bit. Anyways, I looked at this and I thought, what is this, okay? And I mean, everything else made sense, okay? A very practical package of all kind of, thank you, Missions Committee. It was very practical. All the other things were, were wonderful. But this, so I started turning it. I thought, do I smoke it? Like, you know, and so I turned it and I re there's a pen on the end of it. Okay. And I thought it's a pen, you know, well, that makes sense. And then somebody else at the table, one of your missions committee members, Joanne, I won't mention any names, but uh, she grabbed it and she says, it's got to do more than that. You know, so she starts playing with the thing and then she pushes a button on the back. Is this microphone on or which is on? Mine? Mine's on? Okay. So, and then it did this. And then she pushed it again. And it really, really what it's just saying is it's, it's a blah pen is what it really is. It just goes blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, are they trying to send me a message or something here? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen one of these things in my life. I'm going to still try and smoke something in it, though. I really, you know, I think it'll have more effect than, than the blah, blah, blah thing. But anyways, thank you. Whoever thought of this, it's the most unique gift I've ever received in my entire life. Thank you so much. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, there we go. Okay, now that I got that out of the way, put my smoking pipe away. I'll bring, you know, I'll have fun with that tomorrow, going to the airport tomorrow morning, and they'll, they'll be looking at it and trying to confiscate my, uh, my pipe on me. I'll have to hide that. Anyways, let me just share something. Judy and I, uh, I told you, I think on Friday evening, we met at uh, what is now One Hope Canadian Sunday School Mission Camp. That's where we met. First kiss was in the kitchen and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, summer camp is really, really special to us. I just want you to know that. That's, uh, it's always been on our hearts. We've always enjoyed that. You know, if God ever gave me the opportunity to, to work in a camp, uh, you know, in a full-time capacity, I probably would have jumped on it as soon as anything. 
but uh, the Lord's never opened up that door for us. But we've always had a real heart for summer camp ministry. You know, I mentioned, we mentioned Emmanuel's Child, and again, thank you so much for all the gifts that will be going to Disney Novigrad, and uh, the pastors uh, and people there will so, so much appreciate all that you have given uh, for that. That's going to be a very special Christmas for those kids. But one of the things that we do beyond Christmas time is summertime, and in the summertime, we send thousands of kids. That's another component of what we do. We send thousands of kids to camp. We can generally send kids to camp. I don't know, what, what's camp cost around here now? 400 bucks a week? My grand, at least? Okay. So, for, so let's say 400 bucks a week, okay? In, uh, in most of these countries, in Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, some of these countries that we work in, on average, we can send a kid to camp for about 50 bucks Canadian, okay? That, that's really what it costs, generally about $10 a day. And uh, that will take care of them as far as all their food is concerned, their accommodations, and we even give them gifts and everything at the end, plus a Bible and a Bible study and all kinds of other things. And we do that for about 50 bucks a week. Want to hear some numbers? Okay, this, this, is, this is impressive. It's even, it's even more than Emmanuel's Child, if you really want to know. Because we have some donors, uh, some people, some foundations especially, who really jump on this and they get all over it, okay? They love camp ministry and uh, so they, they, they just, uh, they, they impact a lot of kids. So last summer, okay, just this past summer, uh, I'll give you the exact numbers. We had 14,609 kids, okay, that we sponsored at a children's um, uh, evangelical camp, okay? I just want you to know that. Many of them, most of them actually through the Baptist churches. Of those 14,609 kids, 8,442 of those kids came from non-believing families. You see, that's where I came from. I, I, was, I was from a non-believing family. I was one of those kind of kids, you know? And, um, and there they, they took us in, you know? Uh, absolutely incredible. Of those, of those kids, of those 14,609 kids, 2,000 246 kids repented. Now, when we, when we talk, when we say the word repent, repentance is, is a very, very key word in the Slavic world, okay? We don't talk about people coming to the Lord. We don't talk about people, they wouldn't even know what you're talking about if you said those words. Uh, they don't uh, talk about uh, people uh, making a decision for Jesus. They, they, they don't talk in those terms. They talk in biblical terms. They've learned biblical terms very strongly, and they always talk about if a person's going to make, a, a, as we say, a decision for Christ, to accept Christ as personal Savior, the person repents, okay? And so the, the, we, had, we had 2,246 kids repent. Of those kids, 1,175 of those kids are now regularly attending a Sunday school in a local church. Isn't that incredible? Okay. And as a result of all those kids going to church, those kids went home, just as my brother and I did, went home and witnessed to our moms and dads, okay, and 229 adults are now full-time attending a local church. Isn't that incredible? So, you know, I just, I want to encourage you with, with those things. I, I, you know, numbers maybe don't mean anything to, 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 to some people, but uh, they're important, okay? Every one of them is a, is a life before the Lord. And uh, just God, what God can do uh, through those kids is absolutely incredible, and it, it really, it really, really does speak to us. We're going to look at God's Word together tonight, and I want you to turn to the book of Esther with me, if you would. This morning, we looked at three principles. Tonight, I want to look at four, and I won't uh, hold you too long. I want to uh, uh, end well. I want you to go away thinking, oh, that guy was pretty short, you know, he was a, he was a friend. You'll go away real happy with me, uh, and I won't keep you over time here tonight. So let me, let me just... Uh, Let's uh, pray, and then let's, uh, let's just dive into the Word of God. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the opportunity to share it. Father, thank You for the openness that we have. We have the Word of God in, in so many different uh, versions and paraphrases uh, here in, in the Western world. We're uh, able to uh, sit and, uh, and read it openly. We can declare it even in the streets if we wish. Nobody will attack us for, uh, and, and, and jail us. We've heard of Bosnia tonight with so few believers. And uh, Father, we, we just uh, pray for our Russian brothers tonight who have had some uh, restraints put on them uh, as a result of uh, some of the new and most recent laws. And uh, Father, I pray that you'll, our prayer right now as a mission, as, as uh, we pray with our, with our leaders and our brothers there, we're praying for uh, creativity and ingenuity in ways and new ways that they will continue to be able to get the gospel out uh, in a meaningful way. And Father, I just thank you for your word tonight. I pray that you will help us as we look at the book of Esther to just see the incredible way in which you desire uh, to work through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
In the book of Esther, in chapter 4, and that's where I want to start with uh, tonight, I want to look at uh, Esther chapter 4. It's a, it's a pivotal point. In fact, the, the key verse um, in all of the book, perhaps in, in many of our thinkings, if you've looked at this book at all, is probably Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, where you read those words, for such a time as this. You see, the task is unfinished. Even in Esther's day, the task was unfinished. And God was calling Esther to take a step of faith and do something that was going to be absolutely incredible. Now, I don't think she fully realized what she was truly going to do and what the possibility of the cost to her would possibly be as she took that position as the new queen. God put her in a place so that she would have to step up to the plate. And she didn't know, honestly, the scripture tells us, she didn't know, honestly, whether it would take her life and cost her her life or not for what God was going to ask her to do and probably something that she would have never in her lifetime ever dreamed of. It was in 1927 when a fellow by the name of Peter Dynica, who is the founder of the Slavic Gospel Association, he was living in Belarus, which is uh, northwest of uh, where you want to look in a map and you want to see Moscow. It's northwest, and it's, uh, it's a, one of the, the, the parts of the CIS today. And we have an office in Minsk, Belarus. That's one of the places that uh, we have a main uh, hub. We have a printing press there and some various things that uh, go on, and uh, Bible school, and there's some very, very uh, uh, good and, and strong believers that, that are there. But in the outskirts of Belarus, in a small little community, Peter Dynica was just 15 years old. And times were tough. It was communist days, and times were extremely, extremely tough. In fact, so much so that his family were starving to death. They were literally taking... Now, think about this. They were literally taking grass from the backyard, and they were putting it in a pot of water and boiling it and drinking it and trying to get something in order for them to be able to uh, survive some of the struggles. Peter's mom and dad looked at young Peter at 15 years of age and said, Peter, there are some people here in Belarus that have taken some of their sons and daughters and they have sent them to a land away far away and it's called the United States of America and Canada. And Peter, we've chosen you <laughs> and we want you to go, and we want you to earn some money and send the money back so that our, peop our family can stay alive. Now, you think about that in our day and age. If you were to take your 15 or 16-year-old son and put him on a boat and send him to the other side of the world so that he could send some money back home so people wouldn't starve. And that's what happened to Peter Dynica. In fact, his mom and dad put him on a, uh, in a wagon, a wagon that they owned with a horse, and they put him on a wagon, and they, off they went, and they, they, they took off, and they went to town. Peter, at, at the age of 15, in his lifetime, had never, ever seen a train, okay? And when he went to the train station, that was the very first time that he ever had gone to the train station. Never, ever seen a train. And his mom and dad said goodbye to him, gave him a bag, a little bag of clothes, and they shipped him off. You see, he had a cousin that lived in Chicago, Illinois. And they thought, well, if he can get there, they'll take care of him, and somehow he'll make some money, and he'll end up sending it back to us. And so Peter Dynica jumped on that train for the first time in his life, never seen this moving vehicle, and on he got, and away he went. And it took him all the way to the coast, and he got to the coast, and then he got on a ship. And he sailed another two and a half weeks before he got to the port of New York City. He got from New York City, and he got on another train. Don't ask me how he did all this, but he, got on, he couldn't speak a word of English. He got on, a, on another train, and he ended up in Chicago, Illinois. And his cousin picked him up at the train station in Chicago, Illinois. Peter Dynica then, for the next little while, was a very, very lonely young man. Didn't know the language, didn't know the culture. He was completely out of touch with anything and everything. Chicago was a big, bustling city to him. He, didn't, he was totally, can you imagine? He was just totally, totally lost. And for the first time in his life, non-believer at that point, found himself, God, if there's a God out there, please answer me. Please help me because I'm lonely and I don't know what to do and, and I'm just, I'm really, really struggling. That was his prayer. 
God answered Peter's prayer. Because you see, one night on a Sunday evening, he was walking by what is today the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, Illinois. And do you know what was there? A Russian singing choir. And he heard his language. And he went in the door and he stood. He, he, didn't, he didn't want to go in. Like he just stood inside the door and he listened. And one of the ushers, praise the Lord for good ushers, one of the ushers spoke to him and encouraged him to come in. And he ended up speaking to the pastor. And so people came around Peter and Peter began to come back week after week to Moody Memorial Church. And Peter heard the gospel for the first time in his life, and he made a decision to repent. It completely changed Peter Dynica's life. Life went on, and for 11 and a half years, he wouldn't see his mom and dad. In fact, when he went back to Belarus, when he finally went, he was sending money back, but when he went back after 11 and a half years, his brother and his sister both had died. And five weeks before he got there, his father died. He never saw his father alive again. You see, Peter Dynica's life had been changed. And the reason he went back after 11 and a half years is because he had heard the gospel and he was touched. As Brad and Bethany shared tonight, their hearts have been touched to share at a church in Saskatchewan. Well, his heart was touched to touch the people in the Slavic world. And he went back to Belarus to begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, by that time, he had met another fellow in the United States in the Philadelphia area, and the two of them got together, and they decided, like, we, we can do some things together. We, we, we can make some things happen. And, and he began what is today called the Slavic Gospel Association. That was over 80 years ago now. And God began to do a work in Peter's life. Peter began to, to ask God to do some incredible things. And you see, what happened was Peter began to develop a component of his life that I want to look at here tonight in chapter 4. That's very, very important. You see, what we saw this morning with, with those numbers of people coming forward and, and people responding to what, what they heard and the Holy Spirit speaking to them this morning, now you've got to put some action behind what is being said as far as our going forward is concerned. And here's the deal. Peter began to realize that he couldn't do it himself. And he needed a God, a sovereign God who was going to be able to reach out to him, and reach out and, and do things through his life that he couldn't in, possi in a million years dream that, 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 that he could do. And Peter began to do something that was very, very important. He began to pray. In fact, I've ran out of books because I got rid of them all this week. I, I didn't have any more to bring here. I, I brought a number with me and they're, they're all gone. I didn't have any more left to bring to you guys. But if you want some, let me know and I can get them to you, okay? We can mail them to you very easily. But it's a book that Peter Dynica wrote a number of years ago. And it simply says this, much prayer, much power. He goes on to say, little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. And he proved that over and over and over again in his life as he began to lead this mission forward. Today, that mission is divided into two other missions, and there's, there's people being reached in, in incredible, incredible ways as a result of what Peter Dynica did and went through. So let me just remind you, this morning we talked about, number one, God controls all circumstances. Number two, God has a special place for you, both in vocation and location. And number three, God requires our personal obedience. But number four is this tonight, and it's found in chapter four, and I'll show you where, where we're getting this. Number four, if we are going to see God in accomplishing His work, God requires, number four, God requires our fervent, effectual prayer. And I'm using those words very specifically, okay? He requires our fervent, effectual prayer. Pick it up in chapter four, verse one realizing that Haman had come to uh, the king and he wanted to wipe out the Jews. And Esther realized at this point she was going to have to step in and do something that, uh, that God was asking her to do. And, and it, was, it was beyond her comprehension, okay? And here's what we read, and I want to take the time to read this because it's important to understand the passage. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth and ashes and he went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. And he went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. 
And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decrees reached, there was great mourning among the Jews here with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. You see, what Haman was going and proposing to do to the, with the king and with the king's uh, edict to be able to do so was wipe out all the Jews that were in those 127 provinces. So when Esther, in verse 4, when Esther's young woman and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. So she sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called uh, for Hathak and one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her and ordered, her, her ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what, what this was and why it was. And he, Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai, in verse 8, also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me... I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom, and here's that phrase, for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and here's what she asked, to hold a fast on my behalf because she was going to go to the king, okay? And if the king didn't hold out his scepter, she's a dead woman, regardless of how beautiful she looks and how impressive she was to the king previous, he's going to kill her, okay? So she says, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for how long? Three days, 72 hours, night or day. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. You see, Israel was on the brink of distinction at this point. And all the king had to do was say, do it. And the order would have been carried out, and the nation would have been completely wiped out. You see, the book here is, is filled with God intervening in absolutely incredible and miraculous ways. And he does so when we follow certain principles in the Word of God. And one of them that we will find over and over and over again in the Scriptures is this understanding of prayer and fasting. Now, I have no idea, because I didn't ask your pastor, okay? I have no idea to what extent you take prayer or prayer meetings or anything like that in this local church. I would, uh, I would assume that you are a good, faithful, praying church. But let me ask you, when was the last time that you both prayed and fasted? The word fasting is the idea of, 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 a, of a, w- different terms, but one of them is this idea of an earnest prayer. I want you to turn over, hold on to to, to Esther, and I want you to turn over into the book of Matthew, okay? Matthew chapter 9 with me, and see something in the New Testament that speaks to this as well. Matthew chapter 9. You know the passage, 
the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, right? And it says in Matthew chapter 9, at the very end of the chapter, in verse 37, says these words, then the, he said, the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. And then what's he say next? Therefore, pray how? Earnestly, earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I want to ask you here tonight, do we pray earnestly? Do we cry out to God? Do we ask God to do things that only God can do? Let me ask you that. I mean, we are easily led to pray certain things that we think, humanly speaking, that we're quite capable of doing. I know, because I've led hundreds of those prayer meetings. But to pray and ask God to do something in a way that only God can do is another way of praying. You know, like when you, I've been a pastor, I know some of the challenges that you face in a local church. I've been there, done it, many times. I sat in a deacon's meeting one night. And I remember when the church really started to grow, one of the churches that I was involved in. And it was growing at too rapid of a rate for some people to be comfortable with in the local church. And I remember sitting with eight deacons and three pastors in a boardroom. And we were praying, Lord, 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 you know, we, we need to know what you want from us. And I thought we were praying up a storm. And one of our deacons stood up in that meeting. And he looked at me and he said to me, he said, Bill Ball, I'll never forget this as long as I live. He said to me, Bill Ball, if you don't pull it back a little bit, he says, a bunch of us are going to leave. And I thought, what in the world is just happening here? Like, you know, you get in those, those freeze moments, you know, and everything kind of goes in slow motion. And, and I'm sitting there in my mind and I'm thinking, did I just hear what I really heard? Like, did I hear it right? Maybe I misunderstood. So I asked him. I said, are, are you asking me to, to pull it back a notch? Uh, we, we, we're not going to go out and reach as many people. We're going we're gonna, to yeah, tail it off, he said. And I went, I don't believe what I'm hearing. And it, it escalated. Seriously, it escalated. Not volume-wise, but it just escalated. And he said, if you don't do it by the weekend and make some kind of an announcement, like a bunch of us are going to pull out. And I went, I'm, th I'm sitting there. Th I, I looked at my associate and my youth pastor, and I'm, I'm, what's going on here? Seriously? And by Sunday... 10% of our congregation, including four of the eight deacons, had walked out of our ministry. Now, I don't tell you that to brag. I tell you that for this reason. Because for the next five days, I couldn't eat. I was sick. I felt horrible. Because when we went to church that Sunday and all those people weren't there, you know the first thing I thought of? My carnal nature as a senior pastor? They were good givers. They were good money people. They wrote big checks. I'm sure they did. I mean, I had no idea what they were giving, but I was positive they were the good money people. And I can remember my associate, who was older than me, turned to me and he said to me, he says, Bill Ball, get your mind out of the gutter on this one. And he said, let's turn to God. And he had a place called the uh, uh, Shepherd's uh, Retreat. And uh, we went out to his house, to his place. We went upstairs above the wood shop that he had. And we buried ourselves in there for a few days. In fact, his wife came out several times and said, are you guys not going to eat? Like, I'm making meals for you and you don't come and you eat them. 
no, we're not eating. And we prayed. And we prayed. And we just prayed and prayed and prayed. And I'm going to tell you very clearly, God answered prayer. Because you see, within two months, we had more than 65 new people in the church. We doubled the number that left. God did that. To this day, honestly, I can't tell you who those people were in, 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 uh, in ways in which they came. I, I can't. They were all new people. And, and our people just went out when they realized what had happened. We didn't make any big announcements about it. They just went out and they just started reaching people in our community for the Lord Jesus. And we began to see an influx of new people into the church like we hadn't seen in years. And you know, it took us a few weeks, and we looked back on it, and we said, what did God do? And the answer is simple. God answered fervent prayer on our behalf. Because you know something? We couldn't have done that in our lifetime. And God was about building His church. And it was like a slap in the face to us, honestly. It was like God was saying, I will show you guys. No man will control the church. It is my church. It is not your church or their church. It's God's church. And God will do with his church. And he's the one who said in scripture, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen? And God will do that. And we better be very careful. I learned a valuable, many valuable lessons. But one of the main lessons I learned was is that God answers prayer. The second thing was, is that you better be very careful when you start dealing with God's work being done in God's way, and you start tinkering with it. I've learned that with my brothers overseas. I don't fully understand and comprehend how they grow a church. Honestly, I really don't. They have a lot of ways in which we can't even imagine how they try and do church, and guess what? They do church. The main guy that I work with today is the bishop in Volgograd, Russia. I was there eight years ago when he started his local church, a brand new church plant, okay? And you know what he did? He rented a two-bedroom apartment in a basement apartment unit, and that was the only way to get in there and try and reach people for Christ. Because if you didn't, if you didn't get, have an apartment, you couldn't get the code to get in to go and reach the people that were in the building. And there was over 230 different units that were in this one building, and he wanted to reach them for Christ. And he said, the only way I'm going to be able to do it is I've got to rent an apartment so I can get the code to get in there. He didn't even live there. Seriously, he didn't live there. People would see him come and go, and, and, and people all the time going in. They thought it was a drug running operation or something for, I think, the first six months. And he took us there. And within two months of renting that place, he had over 30 people coming to that little local church, all from that apartment building. People who had never heard the gospel in their life before. I'm going to tell you how to go church, plant a church, but it was a good way, okay? And that's what he began to do. I challenge you tonight to think about this, this, this principle, number four. It requires our fervent, effectual prayer. And I don't know how that's going to lead you, okay? You take it and use it whatever way you need to. But I want to tell you, this mission that I work with was established on fervent, effectual prayer and fasting. That's how God works. He hasn't changed, and He's not about to start changing. That's a principle that you can take from now until the time that you get to heaven. And if you don't apply it, you're not going to see God do a work through you. And that applies to you personally. It applies to you corporately as a church. I have seen it. I have proven it over and over again. And, and our, to our shame, many, many times, we don't pray enough and strong enough. Okay? You know, like we, we talk about we need money in the church. So it's like this guy who said, I have good news and I have bad news, you know? And he says, what, the guy came and he said, he says, we have all the money that we need to send, to send the missionaries out. And he says, and the bad news is this, the money's still in your pocket, you know? And maybe we need to pray, and maybe as we pray that God will answer the prayer, maybe perhaps through your life and maybe through your checkbook and maybe through your wallet. I don't know. Number five, God requires, as we see in this chapter, you see he came and, and in verse uh, 
verse 8 and also in verse 14, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on the behalf of her people. If you're going to see God work and in accomplishing his work, number five, it requires the use of words. At some point, you can pray all you want to pray, but at some point, you, you've got to step out and do something. You've got to say something. You see, and for Esther, it was going to take a, a step of faith on her part after they prayed and fasted for those 72 hours. Then they were going to, she, was going to, she was going to have to go, and she was going to have to go and stand before that king and speak to him. And you know what she said here, if I perish, I perish. She had no she had no guarantee that, that in speaking that she was going to receive favor from the king. And, and as we think of that here tonight, it does require the use of words. We have to be very careful as we think about actions and deeds, and they're good, but they're not enough. You've got to speak. Let me meddle, okay? That you, I'm, like, I'm, I'm leaving in the morning, okay? But let me meddle, okay? I'll leave it with your pastor. I heard that you have a Boaz ministry right next door. Am I correct? You go and feed people. Well, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord that you do that. But guess what? I think you need to do one more thing. I hope you do one more thing. And that is you've got to speak. And you've got to share the gospel with those people next door. Okay? And if you're not doing that, I challenge you to go and hand out the food. But at the same time, you've got to speak. I was showing... Uh, one of your young couples, new young couples here in the church the other day, I went and had lunch with them, and I was showing them a little video of, of, of what we do uh, in feeding uh, in eastern Ukraine right now. We've got 1.5 million uh, Ukrainians from the east of, of Ukraine that are part of that war zone in Donetsk and Luhansk down the east side of, of Ukraine and in the Crimea, and they've been displaced. We've got 1.5 million of them on the move, okay, and we're trying to take care of them in local churches. And, and it's, 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 an abs it's a mission field. It's an absolute incredible opportunity that God has given to try and reach over a million people with the gospel. And they come into the church and they live in the church. Many of them live in the local churches all over Ukraine. You, see, you find them everywhere. Just You think Syria, Syria's got a serious problem with all these refugees running all over the place? Guess what? Syria's not the only country in the world where that's happening tonight. I told you this morning, we have 65 million displaced people in the world. Well, part of that group, a million and a half of them are in Ukraine. And they go in there and they, they share the gospel. And, and there are churches that are building additions on the back of, we're, we're supplying money for them, so they can go out and buy a, a bit of lumber and some plastic, and they're putting these temporary additions on the back of their church. And I've got a video, if we had time I could show it to you, but there, there's, a, there's a video of, of them in, in Donbass where they're, they're, they're feeding 300 people a day in the back of the church. And you know what they do with them? It's already on the video. They go in there, and as they're eating, they go around with a microphone, and they start talking to them and sharing the gospel with them, okay, and getting them to share about what they're thinking. And I want to tell you, the honesty from these people on that video is unbelievable. Like, no, I haven't repented yet. I'm thinking about it. You know, you guys are nice guys, but thanks for the food and everything, but, you know, and, and they'll say that right, right out on the video. It's unbelievable. Like, it's all in Ukrainian, but we have subtitles in English on the bottom of this video. It requires the use of words. Number six. If, if we're going to see God accomplish his work, he asks us to be willing to die. To die. I just spoke to my son today. He went up on Friday and rescued a, rescued a family in southern Sudan. He said to me, he said, you know, Dad, I went in there with the, with the, with the plane. I wasn't sure I was even going to come out. Never shut the engines off. Just get them on, get your quick luggage, and let's get out of here. Let's beat it out of here as fast as we can. And they did. Safely got out. Nobody shot at them. I think they were surprised in and out, and they didn't have time to even react. They got them out of there. He said to me, he said to me today on the phone, he's 32 years old. He's got a three-year-old and a one-year-old and, and, and a beautiful wife. And he said to me, this is what God called me to do. If I die, I die. I don't know if I would do that. And I got a son who's willing to go to the line and do those things. Right today in 2016. Number seven, and I'll be finished. There's two unchangeable laws. 
And Esther knew them very, very well in chapter 3 and also in chapter 8. First of all, there's the law of death. And we're all going to die someday. All these Jews were going to die. They were going to get wiped out. And Esther realized that she had to go and stand before the king. And, and the short story is, is that the king said, okay, I change it. Let's change the whole deal and let's wipe out all these others. 75,000 people lost their lives as a result. You read on in the passage of Scripture. It wasn't the Jews. God spared them through the king's edict. God answered prayer. God did something when Esther was willing to step out and actually be counted for God. And she stepped out and she spoke up before the king. The king laid out the scepter and said, I will not kill you. Let's, let's talk. And the king realized what, uh, what, what Haman was doing. Haman was the one who ended up uh, uh, get, get, getting it and, and, and all these others. There's the law of death, but there's also the law of life. And I would challenge you today to think about verses like Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the biggest thing that we can do is share the love of Christ with people in this lost and sinful world that we live in. And I would challenge you today to ask yourself the simple question, are you willing and are you ready? And see, God can take us and can use any of us in absolutely, in, in any incredible way and ways that we wouldn't even begin to dream of. If you would have told me a number of years ago that I'd be doing what I'm doing today, I would have told you you were crazy because I was a very comfortable pastor. Thank you very much. Don't disturb my little world. I enjoyed helping people. We had fun in ministry, you know? God said, I have something greater for you. And maybe God is saying that to you tonight. Maybe God wants to take you, and, and, and whether you're young or old or anywhere in between, God may want to say, take you and, and use you in, in some way that you've never even dreamed possible. Let me ask you the question, are you willing and are you ready? Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. This has been a joy to be together. It's been hard to, to examine, allow the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and uh, to discover uh, where we're at. We thank you for the story of Esther, and we want to thank you for the miraculous uh, truths that we see uh, displayed through the Scriptures. We thank you, Father, that, uh, that Esther was willing uh, to step out and uh, put her neck on the line before a king who had the right and the uh, ability to uh, have her, uh, her life taken or to respond in a more positive way and to spare an entire nation. And Father, we thank you that you heard her and answered her fervent, effectual prayer. Lord, as she prayed and fasted, and as the Jews themselves together prayed and fasted, you heard them and answered. And today, Lord, we have people that are crying out to you, crying out for the truth. They want to understand what the truth is. Brad mentioned to us tonight about, about Muslims. And so many other people groups around this globe that are coming right into the communities in which we live. And they're really crying out for truth. They want to hear what is truth. Father, I pray tonight that you would cause us to move into action for you, however and wherever, uh, that you would see fit to use us. Father, I pray that it will start right here in this local church. Father, I pray that you would uh, just uh, do a work that only you can do. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and the glory for what you want to do through us. And may we get to eternity and be able to stand in heaven and realize there are people there because we were willing to give up our lives as the Lord Jesus gave his for us. In Jesus' name we pray.